we have in the studio, you know we don't usually do intros, but we have a music exec, TV exec, live music exec, reality TV exec, Google all the execs, and in the wonderful world of Ike Chuku. Obi Asika! <laughs> and put all that evil part. <laughs> Obi Asika on the whole truth. Good Thanks afternoon. a lot. I feel Thanks like so. if you're in UK, they put a sound in, so let me just, oh, um, <laughs> let me just much. say it. <laughs> thank, thank you very much. Appreciate that, yeah. man. Appreciate So it. for me, I always like to go back. I'm like the backstory guys. We've been having backstory before the conversation started. Like, how did you get into music or like entertainment? Um, I think I was born into it. You know, um, as a kid growing up in Enugu, um, I was surrounded by music, right? You know how your parents yeah. influence you? And um, the earliest music I remember listening to was from my mother's, my mother's, my late mother's from Ibu Aware. And the music they used to play was very, very deep. It was the Bongo High Life. It was the Peacocks International, Oriental Brothers. And as a kid, this stuff was like pure melody. So I used to listen to a lot of that as a kid. But then at the same time, you know, I was always, always music around, just kid parties and all of this. But I wouldn't say I was into music more than anybody else until maybe my early teens when I discovered hip hop. Mm. <laughs> hip hop changed everything, yeah, yeah. changed everything. Yeah, 10, 11 years old, discovered hip hop. And, you know, two things I remember very well. I remember coming back from England when I was about 10 years old. And um, there's a chap called Professor Uku, Ai Uku. He was a renowned economist and my, one of my father's best friends. And he was in the house and he asked me, so what do you listen to? What kind of music do you listen to? And with confidence, I was talking about all this white boy music that I was listening to. From school, it was man, the police, dire straits, you know, shaking Stevens, which is ridiculous, Adam and the Ants. And he was like, what about Fela Kuti? And I was like, who? And he's like, you cannot not be listening to Fela Kuti. And he was so serious about it. I was like, oh God. So he made me and he said to me, listen, go and listen to this one song and let's talk about it. And that song was Gentleman. Mm. So I'm playing Gentleman that whole holiday. By the end of that holiday, I met my fella fan, right? And then at that same time, I get back to the UK and I kind of start discovering hip hop, Africa Bambata, Soul Sonic Force, Nuclear, some early, early electro yeah. funk. Yeah. And you know, and that's like, because what was happening is hip hop is culture, right? So and I, with that music came the dancing. So we're all sort of, you know, body, we're all, we're, 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 we're all breaking, we're body popping. You know, then Michael Jackson comes and <laughs> does the backslide, yeah, yeah. and we're like, oh, it's cool to do this, you know. So, yeah, that's that's how it all started. What was the transition back home? You know, in terms of here? Yeah. No, no, when I came back, I came back in, in 1990 to do law school, mm. right? And, you know, I was moving back. But before that time, I'd already done a lot of stuff. I, I mean, I used to DJ. I had met Jimmy Jan in like 86, okay. you know, DJ. You know, try, you know I, was try, I went to Cases Joint, which is the Odo Street on Obalende. We stuff we do as a DJ, you know, just to, is he really good? And Jimmy was incredible. And Jimmy and a guy called Bola Fresh Waves mm. were basically holding down Lagos on the party scene. Yeah. So if you were, if you had a party in Lagos, if they weren't yeah. doing the party, <laughs> it wasn't a hot party, right? So those are the first two guys that really got me to say, okay, there's something here. But the thing is, when I was at university, I was really promoting, even before university, I was promoting parties in the UK, right? So I brought Public Enemy and Russell Simmons, yeah, and Leo Cohen, who's chairman of YouTube today, to England in 1989 with a bunch of partners, yeah, while I was still in university. So this is before I come back to Nigeria. So this thing was, it's in me, I'm a natural promoter. And we were, me and my Nigerian brothers actually, for, I don't want to say their names, they don't want to come out now, they're like, <laughs> they're in different industries. But yeah, so we did that and um, came back here in 1990. And in, when we came back, there's one of my guys, uh, I waited for him to come back for a whole year before I really kicked off. Because yeah. he understood what we had been doing in England. I had an older guy called Namdi Ineli, yeah. who was here running a company called um, Geisen, who were like the IBM yeah. people. So they had an office, he had an office on Broad Street. And I used to go there to his office every day. And once a week, he'd go and have lunch in this Chinese restaurant on the eighth floor. Yeah. So I'm going up to, one day we're having lunch up there and I'm looking at this place, I'm like, this place is massive and there's never anybody here. So let's talk to the owner. Why? I said, I'm gonna do a club here. Yeah. yeah. So we did a club called Enter the Dragon in that place. Storm, the original Storm. It's myself, Detola, Olisa, and Namdi. 
and you know, I'd be telling Ulisa, look, you're the guy that people seem to know, so you'd be the face promotion, right? We're gonna go out, do the flyers. I still have the original flyers. My DJs were Jimmy Jack, Howie T, and GMG, yeah? And one side was hip hop, one side was R&B. And we used to have local rappers come and rap after 1 a.m. And you know, the first night, if you've ever done a club or a party, the first night is pure nerves because you don't know if anybody's coming. <laughs> <laughs> so we're sitting there up till like 9 p.m., 10 p.m., just trying to work out shit. Is anybody yeah. coming? Did this thing work? Did it, these flyers we did, they'd never seen flyers in Nigeria before. They, nobody ever put a DJ's name on a flyer. Uh, yeah. Is anybody going to show up? By midnight, there's 2,000 people trying to get in. Oh. We were charging the massive amount of 15 hour. <laughs> <laughs> big money, man. Yeah, of course. <laughs> big money, big money. But when we got our take from the first night, we're like, ooh. Crazy money. Man, this is more than GTB's paying managers. <laughs> so it was like, okay. So yeah, that's, that's like, when I first came back, even though I was going to law school, that's what I was doing. So even when I left law school, I used to go from my job, you know, 9 to 5, go home, have dinner. By 9, 10 p.m., I'm in the studio. Clink in, Clink in uh, Suler, yeah, or Agos and Apapa. Those are the two places that we recorded. I'm in the studio till 4, 5 a.m. Go home, have a shower, then go to work. So my mother just thought I was mad. Mm -hmm. So when do you sleep? I said, we find, we find a way. We find a way because nobody's going to give you any money to do that stuff. But somebody was, nobody was going to give me any money to do that. So I said, you're mad. I said, no, maybe I'm not mad. But I just felt there was something. So was that a transition from doing that to like the clapper board reality TVs where you're like looking for rappers and looking for entertainment stars? Yeah, well, I mean, the transition was kind of like from the rappers that we found at Enter the Dragon. You know, and also I had recorded some artists in the UK before, because I'm a DJ as well, right? So is there anything you haven't done? <laughs> there's a I'm sure there is, but you know, so you're listening in and you're like, hmm. So when we had the idea, which is me and Olisa, to do Clapperboard Weekend Raps, you know, and the soul was spiked, and Clapperboard is the first private TV channel yeah. station, right? And we get this show, and you know, I'm producing the show, he's directing, and we're like doing it at a place called Sizzlers. Sizzlers is a VI just like a sort of like a, a, a food bar or something, right? And um, yeah, the idea basically is, you know, there were no producers. It was Jimmy Jack, and Jimmy's playing instrumental beats. A Block, a guy called Freddy, who's now a multimillionaire, was the host of the show. Another brother living off crime was his rap <laughs> name, right? And these kids were just doing their thing. And guys come on an audition. I mean, Daddy Shoki, that's how I met him the first time. He came with his crew from Ajegunle. You know, I think fresh, busy crew or pretty bit. I always get the name wrong. He's always telling me off. <laughs> yeah, Obi, no, it was fresh, pretty crew. I said, okay, but hey, it's 30 years ago, man. You know, but the, his crew was solid. There was a bunch of guys, and then these kids, Junior and Pretty, showed up. You know, and that kind of changed the whole thing. We had already when Junior and Pretty showed up, I'd already completed an entire album with a guy called Nadine, which is Nuruddin, but Nodine. He's still he's a civil servant in Abuja. Nodine was a vicious rapper. I mean, I, Edward Inyang, Blackie is like my, my brother. I drove Blackie to um, Lucky Sunsplice when he won his contract. And, um, but I was targeting to kill Blackie. <laughs> I, was like, I, was like, I was like, bro, man, you've been, you've been too big for too long. Because yeah. Blackie's like, to me, he's like the first pop star. Yeah, I remember those jams when I was in prison. Yeah, like, Rosie. Because of Rosie. Yeah. Oh, man. Blackie. Yeah, so Blackie, Blackie. Skank, Rosie. Yeah, Blackie I mean, Skank. Blackie's coming hard. Yeah. So, but I'm like, Blackie, I've got this guy, true black man. No Dean, he's gonna take you out. <laughs> so, you know, but we couldn't get him a deal. We tried to do a deal with Premier Music, they weren't listening, Sony wasn't listening. Because don't forget, there were major labels yeah. then, right? And um, they would say, no, 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 no. And I went to Sony and I'm harassing my big auntie, Auntie KG, Mrs. Okunuwa, who was oh. the CEO. I said, yeah, you've got Def Jam. You, you own Def Jam in Nigeria. You know, that means you've got LL, you've got Maxi Priest, you've got all these people, and you're not releasing the music. I said, why would I release the music? I said, because we're here. <laughs> Us young people is what we want to listen to. But she was like, no, no, she's not Peter's. Mm -hmm. I do like you, but I'm yeah, like, yeah, yeah, I get it. So that, 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 so yeah, that thing it. is part of what's going on at the time. You know, so it pushed us to sort of take it from, okay, take, we've done the club, we know this thing is there. We've seen these young talents. Clap Award Weekend Raps. And that show used to go out on, um, I think, Saturdays. Yeah. And it was syndicated to like 30 stations. And Jimmy Jack's the DJ, <laughs> and at the end of the show, Jimmy's yeah, scratching, song, yeah. and and you can and it says get your mixtapes from Seventeen Odo Street, and his phone number. 
So everybody Ooh, in Nigeria began to call Jimmy. Jimmy. And Jimmy begins to go on the road from 92 to universities and campuses. And he's doing roadblock in Obalende. So all these things are happening. And Jimmy is like a massive funnel. Like literally, I would say between 92 and 2000, 60%, 70% of all yeah. the artists you came through Jimmy Jam. Yeah. True. Yeah. Even the DJs, they came through Jimmy because you need, you need you need somebody to look up to somebody. There's a guy, Grandmaster Lee, that came before Jimmy. Yeah. There are other people, but you know, Jimmy's foundational, right? And then he has never changed. You know, the most humble guy. It's a bit like Two Face. Very understated, totally humble, and just about the movement. Because this is a time when you're being accused of being Raz if you're playing local music, you know? <laughs> yeah. It's like, why are you playing local music? Obi, why are you even paying attention to these people? I beg, I beg, I beg. Mm. I said, we'll get there one day, right? And I think it's a bit like, so when we, even when, when, when um, Junior and Pretty showed up and they're rapping in American accents, you're like, guy, you've never been to the States. Why don't you just, That's why you got it, dude. Then just talk as you talk with your guys, you know? Because people are still in this whole thing, they have to do BBC voice. I'm like, no, just do your own natural voice. Do you know, like, all that, do you know them, Monica, Bolan, do you know like, they were going to be hits? Did you have that? Well, the minute, if, if the, we, minute they, the minute they performed, Listen, when they went away and came back a month later, or three weeks later, they got on stage. Even in the pre-audition, it was a rap. Mm. Right then and there, as it happened, everybody there was like, oh my God. Because the guy gets on stage and goes, Mana, Mana, Monica, don't, don't kill me. <laughs> and we're like, what did he say? Ah, and he just starts going on. And he had, there were three songs they did the first day. Um, Monica, Ghanaian lover, my Ghanaian lover. And we were like, oh shit. Did we know? We parked the other album. I had a full album. Mm. We parked it. It never came out. <laughs> <laughs> we put out Junior and Pretty. Those guys must have sold two, three million. Mm. We sold maybe two fifty thousand. We didn't see no money. Get, Sony Music distributed for us. But I think it was across West Africa, mm. and we released them to Premier. Because now Premier like, oh yeah, now we want to do it. <laughs> so we released them to Premier. Premier did the, the next album, Bolanle, and all those yeah. things. And then they became, those guys were doing Benson and Hedges' Golden Touch yeah. tones. They were working on the rig, you know, because a lot of people don't understand in the game. Yeah, you might see this guy as an artist, but actually he's also yeah. a front of house engineer. He's a producer. So they, I mean, Pretty has stayed in that as, live, as a live event guy yeah. for the last 20 years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the primary thing he was doing. Unfortunately, Junior left us yeah. like 2005, I think. Yeah. Fast forward a bit to Storm. What was it like having... Also having like that pool of talent, like oh. having, heading that. Well, moment. the thing is this, is that it, it's sort of, it's like an evolution, right? Because that was like the second coming of Storm, right? We'd already done the Junior and Pretty thing. Then we sort of took a break because, frankly, we didn't have the money. Mm -hmm. And it, just, it was hard to see a way through. There was no distribution. The pirates were killing you, you know. But then what happened was, to be honest, it's Jimmy. Yeah, and Olisa, because Jimmy keeps sending music, right? <laughs> by this time, and Olisa by this time is on Cool FM, Jimmy's getting music and sending me music every, every, literally every week. So I'm getting all this local music and I'm not listening to a lot of it. But around 2001, I started hearing a little bit of Tribesmen. Mm. I'm like, hmm. Because I'm a hip hop head, so I'm like, who are these guys? And I've been hearing Swat Root and all these guys oh, from yeah. Abuja. So I'm like, hmm. And then Dari was always around us, right? You know, and I'm like, in 2004, Darry's gonna go to um, Project Fame. And I'm like, before he went, I'm like, Darry, you know you can win this thing. I don't really care who's in the house. If you just do what you, you know, just your natural percent, you can win this thing. So let's, let's focus. And he almost did, I think he came third. Um, and this is just my own idea, the time that, this is our Nigerian thing. You know, when we express ourselves, we tend to, we will dominate. But before he went to the house, we recorded six tracks for an EP. We were that confident. I was like, listen, here's the money. Let's go to the studio and knock these songs out. And one of the songs, well, we argue about whose song it is, <laughs> but Young Man with LD Maybe and KB from, from Tribesman. Yeah, so my, my car's in that video. <laughs> <laughs> Guy showed up one day and said, man, I need to use your car, yeah. right? So, yeah, so he, when he went, he came straight out content and even that's how when I met Tola because I'm, I'm in Joburg yeah, yeah. like just before the end of the show trying to work out okay I'm gonna have to talk to BMG because they've got a deal for him and all these things 
and there's this guy running around who's trying to do some kind of deal. I didn't know what he was doing. So I, was like, I was like, who are you? He says, yeah. his name's Tola. I said, what are you doing here? And, uh, this, and he was consulting for Diageo, yeah. who wanted to take Dari as some kind of ambassador straight out of the show. I'm like, I said, guy's not happening, man. This guy's a stone property. You can't take him like that. So I said, why don't you just come and be with Stone? You know, let's just build this thing together. I think, I think that might be more natural. And to be honest, that's what happened. I think we flew back, either we flew back to Nigeria together, mm -hmm. by the time we are in Nigeria, that guy, you know, and really, you know, whatever I did with Stone Records, Tola definitely is at least 50% because he's the guy with the talent. He's the guy sitting with the talent. He's the guy, you know, like NATO used to translate Tola's lifestyle. <laughs> when we say, you know, my P, all that language, all that language is boulders. Yeah. But NATO has that talent, you know, to bring it just together. Just connecting, I'll be Bobby Bones. Yeah, just, <laughs> you understand? Yeah, just connected, yeah. Exactly, exactly. So you, you get sense, like, tons and tons of music. Mm. So two-part question, where do you get this ear for talent from? And have you missed out on, like, anybody? You're like, oh, man, I, I, listened, I, I heard this person, but I didn't sign this person. Nah, listen, I mean, look, first things first is that you miss out every day. Right, because there's so much talent and there's so many different genres of music. So even when you're hearing the music, the first thing you're trying to work out, okay, can the person sing? A lot of people can sing. Yeah. Got a decent song, yes, but those two things don't necessarily make a star. Mm. Now the personality and the look, mm. if you get that as well, now, you, now you're getting close to, okay. okay, I have a star. Now if the song has a bit of edginess to it and you're like, okay, and, and I come at it from a DJ's perspective, so I'm listening for the hook. Mm. I'm thinking, okay, where's this gonna work? Is this a who is the audience for this record? And what is the story of the artist behind the record? Those are the things I used to use to analyze music every time. It's like, if it's an artist that's trying to be somebody, I'm not interested. Because loads of artists come at you, I'm the next Wiz Kid, I'm the next <laughs> David O. I'm like, Wiz Kid is Wiz Kid, David O is David O, the bands is the bands. Be the first version of yourself. If you're the first version of yourself, we can pay attention. If you're mimicking somebody, psh, it's not gonna work. And I was wrong a few times, and that happens, and there's nothing wrong with that. You know, I just always hoped that the artists that we were wrong about <laughs> didn't feel that we were... Major yeah, major. I think we missed Bracket. Mm -hmm. I think Bracket was one of the guys that we saw their stuff early. I know I saw Yemi Aladi at 16, mm -hmm. and I remember that. But it wasn't really that we said no, I was just like, she needs to be a solo. I felt the personality, she still needed development. Um, I know we connected with Kid with EME, mm -hmm. so we didn't miss him, but we knew, we saw, right? Of course, David O, Ace is, my, is like my son. So this thing was happening right in front of us, yeah. right? And David O and Co was stressing NATO to jump on a record for almost a year. And I was like, guys, these guys are really, really intense, you know? And it's like, everybody's trying to work out, is this the new energy, you know? Because, because you, just, you, you don't know what's the trend that's coming. And when David did his first record with NATO, I remember saying to them, and their first video, the second video, Omar yeah. Babalao, I had to call Clarence. I said, man, you guys did that video? You shut down the bridge at 4 a.m.? I'm like, damn, man. I, was, I, call, I remember telling Tola, I said, Tola, these kids are not playing. No, they're not playing. I mean, it's like, you know, this is 2011 or something. I'm like, I think we're seeing the future right here. So I wouldn't say we missed out on them. I think we're still part of the journey. For sure. But there are people, yeah, definitely, you know, that, I mean, Jidenna, you know, um, Flavor, guys that we saw early that, you know, but I'm just so happy about some of them. Flavor's about to do a billion views on his own YouTube channel. That's crazy. Yeah. And people don't really think about him, yeah. the well, size of yeah, artist yeah. that he is. Yeah, I mean, he's, he's, he's as big as anybody, right? Sure. But, yeah, so there's a lot of talent. And that's the thing about Nigeria. In every inch of Nigeria, there are people sitting there trying to break out. You know, and that's still the biggest challenge in Nigeria. If you're sitting in Kafanchan or Nowere, how do you get out, right? How do you get heard? And the challenge is, how do you even get heard in Lagos? You know, forget these ones that are being blowing worldwide. Because <laughs> Lagos people, we don't have time. It's like, I beg, I beg. So that still is part of it, right? So yeah, it's a hard question. It's hard to say. I don't even, wanna, I don't even know whether I should be apologizing that. <laughs> so obviously, man of many talents, which do you prefer? production, music, talent shows? Like. I mean, I think my preference is I haven't done the thing that I really want to do yet, which okay. is make originals, right? Oh. I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to make original dramas, films, and uh, I'm a storyteller. Everything I've always done is storytelling. It's just the different lenses. So whether it's art, whether it's music, whether it's reality, whether it's 
game shows, but we try to insert some values into the storytelling. So we were very intentional, right? That, okay, we're Nigerian, we have attitude. It is positive attitude and it's positive energy and we bring it with us wherever we go and it's a movement. And that's really the energy behind Afrobeats. So Afrobeats is really when hip hop is domesticated, mm. right? Because my label is a hip hop label. Yeah. It wasn't called Afrobeats. We spent half the year, the decade trying to work out what the name is or what we're doing, Nigeria hip hop, African mm -hmm. hip hop. Now there are loads of websites, nigeriahiphop.com, Afrohip Afro hop, <laughs> all the guys, right? And you know, I'm, and you know when you're hip hop, you're like, nah, I'm not signing no singers. So all the guys who were singing trying to come to us like, nope. I mean, it's only until we got like GT and YQ that we're like, oh, okay. The singing thing, because we, we had Dari early, yeah. but like, okay, Dari's okay. He can be kind of, because Dari can kind of rap. Yeah. So we're like, okay, Dari be with us on that tip. But the thing about it is like, if I think about it now today, I feel like the way things are evolving and the way they continue to evolve, the foundational sound, right, is still fusion. So the base of our music is that connection between hip hop, R and B, dancehall, and our own indigenous sounds come together. That's Afro beats. So speaking of Afro beats, let me segue into it. Do you think this new Afro beats exposure is a good thing? Of course, it's exactly what we wanted. It's exactly what we fought for. You know, and what people don't understand is if, if you were, if you're releasing a single yeah. on the East Coast of America, you need a million dollars just for radio promotions to three states. Nobody here has that money. It's not possible. So, but what has happened is that the social media platforms have enabled a situation where independent artists worldwide can show the muscle. So now what you have is a situation where a lot of the biggest Afrobeats artists have more followers than American hip hop artists. They have a bigger heat map. People can, see, can track the data and say, okay, in the New York area, I've got 600,000 fans. In this area, I've got that. So it's still, and that's all about how you get to radio. So Afrobeats is still just starting, okay? And that's why you're still just, you know, there's, a, there's an ecosystem play. So and getting to radio is the most important thing. And we literally probably just got to US mainstream radio in the last two years. There have been guys, you know, we've had tracks, yeah. but in terms of regular rotation. And when that begins to happen, and now there's a Billboard Afrobeats chart, another two, three years. Because Afrobeats is, I call it Afrobeats culture. It's more than music, right? And what happens with that, that's why, that's why our, hip hop is our first cousin because hip hop is culture as well. So, so with Afrobeats comes the attitude, the dance, the fashion, all those other elements, the food as well, that make it richer than just the song. But obviously you're seeing what's happening with TikTok and the activations and social. So we get people like CK, Goya Meno, you know, the Buga. These things, is it heads of state around the world trying to Buga. It, it, it's, it's joyful to me, you know? That's, I think Afrobeats is bringing joy to the world. So, Journey of the Beats, I was watching a clip from it, and you said Two Face is the one of the most, well, the most important. I think it's the band, but obviously, two legends can coexist. Mm. <laughs> so, why no, do you no, think, no, think, think Two Face is? No, no, it's, uh, you see, the thing is, it's about the time frame. Okay. I said Two Face is the leader of the new school. Yeah. The band will tell you the same thing. The band is the guy that took it to the next level. Mm. But the guy that everybody was following is Two Face. The band was following Two Face, P Square following Two Face, but P Square was doing stadiums before Two Face outside around Africa. But the band, right? The band is a force of nature. So what you see happening is that Oliver Twist is for me the global breakout of Nigerian Afrobeats. Azonto blew first, but Oliver Twist, because then the world got to encounter a piece of the band's personality, and the band's personality is Afrobeats, right? It's hip hop, but it's Afrobeats. Is that, is that, that's what they say, it's an entertainer, <laughs> but it's what it really is, is a master performer, right? A guy who owns the stage, any stage he's on. And what happens is, so you're, we're both right. You yeah, understand? Right we're both right. Two-Face is the leader of the new school. The band is the guy that broke the bridge. Yeah. P-square, we're kings of the hill. <laughs> That's it. Perfect dancer. Three kings. No, they're three kings. Like right now, they're three kings. Burner, Wiz, David. True. It is what it is. 
So Afrobeats documentary flying red, left, right, center, middle. <laughs> For somebody that hasn't seen Journey of the Beats, what's mm. different? What makes it different from like what is out there? From backstory? Yeah. I think there are two different ways of telling a story. Yeah. So one way to tell the story is to tell it from POV, yeah. point of view. Yeah. And I think that's what backstory is. And Ayo will tell you himself, it's his point of view. Yeah and his experience and what he saw. And he was based in London from there to Atlanta and he was coming here occasionally. Um, with us, yeah. we, we had a research team of six historians and writers. So it's not my point of view. We researched extensively. We did a lot of work, right? We interviewed well over 400 people. In the UK, in Ghana, in Cuba, in Nigeria, in South Africa, and of course in America. So when you think about that, and to be honest, we still missed people. <laughs> no, 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 no. We missed people. I mean, you know, it's just not an if but. We were under a tight timeline. But, you know, the point about it is, so ours is more of a collective, right, telling the story, which was like the way that we wanted to tell the story. Because I feel it's a movement. And in a movement, there are many, many players. So I can't really ascribe the movement to any one person. I think that there's so many different things happening in so many different places. So if, if DJ D Money out of Chicago and the Nigeria DJs coalition that he had, if they, were, if they didn't exist, our music doesn't spread in America yeah, 12 years ago, right? Cos Canino in New York and the guys in New York who are doing the Independence Day parades and Top by a Strong, if those guys don't exist, we don't have that, you know? So there are plugs everywhere, Abbas and Shopsy and Smade in London, yeah. Waxy and Joburg. So for me, it's Joburg first, actually, then London, right? Then from London, begin to spread. Then, of course, guys were going to Indonesia, Hong Kong, as well as going to Canada and the States. So really, it used to be like an Afrobeat Chitlin circuit, almost like the Black Chitlin yeah, circuit yeah. in the 50s, right, in America. And that's where guys were playing. They were playing at schools, clubs, private party, until. So we've gone from there to the O2. You know, we've gone from there to the O2, and that's an incredible thing. So final question before we wrap it up. What's Obi I don't like you have like million and one things. <laughs> so what's Obi has to come to now? No, I'm, I'm still telling stories. We're still trying to tell stories, I'm trying to make the next couple of series, uh, maybe some new big reality formats. And then also, you I know... I heavy into music. Man, I can't get away from it, man. <laughs> You know, I mean, I'm here doing this. I mean, one of the things that I'm really excited about as well is the whole NFT space. Mm. You know, yeah, there's some work we're doing in that space that I think will be very interesting because what, what I'm always about is ecosystem, right? So on the ecosystem of what is going on, where are the biggest opportunities? And I still believe the biggest opportunities are in Nigeria, right? So in Nigeria, we have, what, 400 universities, 40 stadiums, right? We have places like Aba who are producing merchandise and content for the entire West Africa. And we have this soft power that has at least a billion followers. So what's next is monetization here. Yeah. That's, that's gotta be next for everybody. Because when we monetize here, then your artists will not be abroad the whole time, okay? Because WizKid has not toured Nigeria, Burner has not toured, Ruga has not been seen. Mm. Do you get what I'm saying? Yeah. So if, if you're a 16 year old kid in Kaduna, you'd be hearing, You've never seen these people. If you're on Joss, you've been hearing, you've never seen them. You know, how many times has Two Face played Joss or MI? Do you get what I'm saying? So we have to find a way to build our domestic touring capacity, have more venues, merchandise, platforms. These are the things that I'm thinking <laughs> about. So you only get better, man. You only get better. Well, this is well, what it is is this is I mean, you know, I was privileged to lead the technical working group for the for the National Development Plan, looking at these sectors, you know, really the larger play, like hospitality, creative industries, culture. But I look at it, uh, we looked at it and we've done our numbers. These sectors will be possibly $100 billion per annum contribution to the Nigerian economy by 2030. But do they see it? Do well, people... It doesn't matter whether they see it or not. That's the whole point. And we told the government, mm. with or without you, this is what is happening. Fashion is $8 billion a year today. The government is not involved. Do you understand? The music people, we've never had a dime from government. 
I'm sitting here live, 2022. Nollywood has spent the last 10 years sending their time chasing for money, but the truth of the matter, I don't know if that's really helped them. But for us in the music industry, there's no support. So what is the support the music industry wants to see? We want to see opening up the platforms, mm -hmm. better connections, logistics, security, venues. We don't need money to record music. We don't need money to do the brand and the marketing. We need to see the superstructure. And if the superstructure is in place, nobody can stop us. Mm. That's it. Because Nigeria, let me tell you this. <sighs> if, how much do you think, if Wizkid were to do a 40 stadium tour in Nigeria, 20,000 per stadium, that's 800,000 tickets. You know we can sell that out. For sure. Okay, so 800,000 tickets, what's the average price? <laughs> let's, let's just be, let's just do the maths. It says 5K. What's eight times five? About a month. <laughs> it's like, it's not, I never know what it is. Hmm? 40 times five. Who's good at maths? Hmm? 40? No, that's 40, right? Yeah. That's 40 billion. Yep. Yeah. <sighs> yeah. Mind blown. No, but it's not even mind blown. This is real numbers. We didn't talk about merchandise. Hmm. So that's a ticket. What happens to the guy selling soft drink at those venues? So you have to understand, these things are economic activities. So, because when you go watch a concert, you're going to buy food and drink. Yeah. If the guy has a t-shirt, you might buy it. If he has an album, you might buy it. So that 5K, you're probably going to spend 20K. True. So 800,000 times 20K, 1.6 billion or 16. Do you understand? Yeah. That's where we're, that, it's that economy that we need to get into. Right, and this economy is an economy that right now worldwide, live entertainment industry is a $50 billion plus industry. So there's no reason why in a country like Nigeria with an average age of 19, think about it, man. <laughs> think about it. Oh, yeah? Thank you very much, man. So join your beats, where can we catch it? Please, it? please, please. I mean, it's on Showmax right now, originals, exclusive. I had a crew of 60 plus that helped make that show. Because what was really important to me was that we told our story. Yeah. Not, not Apple Music, not Spotify, not YouTube, who are all great platforms, but they're not us. Yeah. You know, I think it's important that when you do something intentionally, you go and tell people why you did it. Not that somebody comes later and says, you were discovered. <laughs> yeah? You know, that's how Africans get discovered. Yeah. You'd be sitting in your house for 200 years, and somebody says, well, I discovered that place. <laughs> yeah. shout, out, shout out white people. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't, say, I, didn't say it, nothing, yeah. I didn't say nothing. I didn't say nothing. I didn't say nothing. And there you have it, guys. Entertainment legend will be as it comes to hold truth. And we're out. So I think Please. you have to do it.